We started in business in 2001 with my partner, Joe Lucas. We started out as a retail plant, um, consulting business, um, got into custom app, got into fertilizer. Then three years ago, we had a big layer facility come into our area, and we got involved with that, with the manure. I got 10 full-time employees, and then when we were busy, with uh, all the equipment we got, we run 15 people pretty much all summer long. Originally, when we got into the manure business, I thought we could use our lime trucks to spread it. Uh, the manure we use is about 40 to 50 percent moisture, so uh, we just couldn't run through our box uniformly you know, enough. So we went to uh, did a lot of research. Went to a TB box. They're made in Germany. We spread basically uh, a 50 foot pattern. There's two beaters on the back end of that, back end in, the, in the back end of the spreader in the compartment, and uh, it grinds the manure up, drops it straight down on spinners, and it spreads chicken manure just like, uh, and cattle manure too, just like uh, a fertilizer spreader spreads fertilizer. It's just as uniform as a uh, fertilizer spreader. I've never seen anything like it before. About every farmer we go to, especially when we first got into it, uh, they'd walk behind it. I never seen farmers so excited about crap, and uh, and I don't know how many fields I walked, and they just amazed at how uniform them that manure is out. It, it is pretty phenomenal. We do a lot of fertilizer in front of wheat. Um, we use the manure as a wheat fertilizer. You know how sensitive wheat is. If there's any variability, it shows up. There'll be absolutely no variability in it. Uh, where we have it on plots in the wheat fields, where we've done the wheat with regular fertilizer versus the chicken manure, we haven't seen any yield, yield drag at all. So um, we originally, them boxes uh, come with wheels. Uh, they don't make them with uh, tracks. Uh, we're up in Defiance County, and we do a lot in Paulding County, and we got a lot of laddy clay, so compaction is a big issue up there. In the first year, we ran them with the wheels, and our biggest that was one of our biggest complaints is the uh, wheel marks we left in the field, and then the guys that were chiseling, they said they could fill every one of them. I checked all over the U.S. and got online, tried to find some people overseas. I could not find a company that would put tracks underneath a commercial um, manure spreader like that and warranty it. Um, they did, as soon as you told me it was in the commercial um, manure business, they said they didn't want nothing to do with us. Well, I found a place in uh, Illinois that built the system that was under the there. That we ran them one year. One track's in getting re-engineered right now, and then the other one will go into them too. They held up for the year, but there's stress cracks all over them, so they're redesigning them. Um, actually, the one the spindle broke on us, and uh, it takes you about nine hours if the spindle breaks and the track gets wedged underneath there to get it jacked up and emptied out and out of the field. That's not a fun day. And that's always, that was on a Sunday, so that just shows you don't work Sundays. Like I said, the big thing we had was a um, compaction was a big issue. And not only from the spreader itself, but from the loader. Um, so we went to uh, flotation tires for all the loaders that's in the field. And don't ask me the size because I can't tell you off the top of my head. And uh, that made a world of difference because every place we had a pile, when uh, they would go to uh, chisel, a lot of them guys would have to chisel that where the pile was two or three times. When we went to the flotation tires on the loaders, they can chisel right through it like it's nothing. So um, that made a, a, uh, a big difference too. Compaction, our first year was our number one complaint. We spent almost a quarter million dollars in flotation tires and tracks to try to eliminate that. So, and it was probably the best investment we made because it's been all positive response from the farmers. Basically we cover a roughly a 20 mile radius. Um, by doing that, we can usually, 
with uh, three semis per machine, we can keep up. Uh, if we get beyond 20 miles, um, then we got to add another semi to them. Um, the facility we work with, um, once the manure hits the uh, storage buildings like this, from that point in time, it's our responsibility to get it out. So that's our loader in there. That loader's on cement, so we don't have flotation tires on that one. But uh, um, like I said, it usually takes three trucks. We haul every bit of it out, the, out to the field, stock, or not stock, but pile it, and then uh, load it from there into the uh, machine. Um, Glenn talked about this, and Eric did too. There's different types of manure. Um, different values for different types of manure. There's all kinds of literature where you can look at and see what your beef and, and the type of storage the manure is in, whether it's a lagoon or not. Uh, I'm not going to get into the other livestock. We do do a fair amount of cattle manure too, but the majority of what we do is, is chicken litter. So uh, I'm just going to try to stay on on that. But when you get in the chicken manure side, each the two facilities we use, the chicken litter is a permitted facility, and then the cattle place we work with is a permitted facility. And every facility is required by law to have a, a, a new, or a analysis of the manure there. Um, this is just happens to be a, a copy of one. Um, they're only required, I'm pretty sure it's just one sample a year. We're, we kind of do things a little different. We actually sample every pile we put in the field. Uh, so I do them in sequence. For the last two years, we've got over 600 samples we pulled. So we've got a real good database of what our average uh, nutrient level is for the barn. It's very expensive to do that. But uh, when, you're, when you're trying to promote it as a fertility program, I don't know, the more data you got, the better. We used to do a complete test like this. And that'd give you your NPK, all your micros, your calcium. Um, on this protect, we send our samples to A and L. It gives lists what what it's got, and then on the far column it lists what's available the first year. Um, our chicken litter, in comparison to the beef manure that Eric was talking about, and the swine manure that Glenn was talking about, most of our N is organic N. And uh, so it's a lot slower release. Mother Nature has a lot to do with how much of that's released over that time. When we're doing an analysis for a farmer, we usually figure about 60% of that that we can use. I think that might probably be a little light. But um, this, I think this next one is just the second page. It gives you some more of the micros and stuff in there. Uh, one thing nice about chicken litter is, and this is bad because we was in the custom lime business, but as you use chicken litter, your lime usage will go down because of the calcium that's in the uh, in the litter itself. Um, you'll get to the point that you won't be liming anymore. Uh, there's some sulfur in there, which is good because it's a big thing right now where all of our tests are coming back low on sulfur. This particular sample... The moisture in it was 50%, the top line there. This facility, the uh, um, manure is underneath the cages. It drops down onto the belt. The belt's got blowers on it. As the as manure comes out of the building, it goes, it's supposed to be the way the building is designed. When it comes out of that building, it should be 45%. Then it goes in the storage building where that, that picture I had with the semi. And it's supposed to technically lose 5% um, moisture as it sits in that building. Uh, this particular facility, and from what I understand, most of these facilities don't quite get down to that 40%. We probably do average over the whole year 50%. I have had, of the 600 and some samples, I had one sample that was under 40% uh, and it was 38 Um as you get to uh, some of the older style uh, chicken houses where the uh, birds are upstairs and the manure is downstairs, a lot of that manure is 12 to 18 percent moisture. Um, it's got a lot higher nutrient content to it because it's drier. Um, 
The limitations to that dough is when you uh, custom fly that, you got dust, and uh, so you're really limited on because of wind. Uh, you got a neighbor's house, the windows are open, that dust is in dirt, that's manure going in the building, so you got to be careful about that. They got beetles that can live in that uh, dry manure, uh, so you got to uh, treat your, the manure to try to control them beetles. Uh, with the liquid, the, the wetter manure like we use, that's not an issue because the piles get too hot and the beetles can't survive, so that's the one nice thing about it. But then again, if you're using manure, big difference. If you're pulling out a facility like we pull out of, you're uh, going to have a higher moisture. If you pull out a facility that's got a basement and the manure goes through there, uh, you're going to have a drier, a little higher nutrient value, but then you got more insect issues you got to deal with, plus the dust can be quite an issue. So basically, you uh, get to the point where you think, all right, we're ready to spread manure, and then you come into the state requirements. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time over the laws because they actually, well, I don't want the liability, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> so, um, but the first thing we got to do is every field that we spread manure has to have a current soil sample. We try to keep ours within three years. Um, if it's a new guy that we've never dealt with before and he, and he say he's got one that's four years old, we'll accept that the first year, but then after that we try to get him in a three-year sample. Or we even got guys in the corn bean rotation that'll sample every two years. Um, from that sample, we'll make our uh, recommendations. We use Tri-State basically how we do ours. And what we do is we took, take that sample that we had to, the uh, nutrients in, um, We'll use that, and then we'll look what the buildup is and what the crop removal is. One thing about chicken litter is it's high nitrogen, so a lot of your value is in that nitrogen. So we, it works ideally like we use it in front of wheat, and then if you put it in front of corn, and then you use enough litter for that corn and bean uh, for the next crop of beans afterwards. If you put it in front of beans, you pretty much have to take all that value of the end that was in the bean or in that manure and basically discard it because the beans aren't going to utilize as much nitrogen. So it really has a beautiful fit in front of wheat and in front of corn followed by a bean crop. Now we do put it in front because we, again, we're in, Paulding, uh, in Defiance County, heavy clay. We got a lot of beans back to beans back to beans. When you're in that rotation, you can really see a quick response with a litter. Very quick response. Um, but for the most part, we just use Tri-State. We do VRT on occasion. Uh, this just happens to be one that uh, um, we VRT. Um, that was an interesting field because there's there's probably 500 acres dra drains across the center of that, and that red's where we didn't apply any manure. And there's so much sediments landed there. Well, this was the first time we sampled that field. And we won't be putting manure on there for my lifetime anyways. But uh, it just had so much sediments that fall in there. Because there's a highway, that's a itty bitty town there. That highway makes a nice dam, so that water usually sits there for two days on a big storm, so the sediment just falls down. But uh, we do VRT, um, mostly for guys that's been in the VRT. And they've got their levels pretty much uniform, or they got they got spots where it doesn't need as much. So, for most of what we do, though, we do a straight spread across. We got some spots where we got a lot of sand ridges, and we got organic matters less than one percent. Um, we'll VRT over them ridges instead instead of putting two ton on, we'll put four ton on there. I've got one farm that we've done. Uh, we actually put cattle manure on the sand ridges and chicken litter on the rest of the field because we got a real big organic matter issue on that one. So uh, it's kind of unique what you can do. State also requires that we have to uh, have a map with all the setbacks in it. And uh, this, what we've been using, is this is our as applied map. And uh, um, 
All these uh, white spots are areas that uh, are basically all waterways, and it shows you that we did not spread on, in the waterways, and we had our setbacks. If I get the pointer one, oops. That area right there is the house that we had to stay away from. Um, that's an actual road up there. But we're required, every, every farm that we do, we have a book, and in that book, it has uh, a um, soil test, the current soil test. We, uh, we do an actual map of the field. We do most of them off Google Earth. And uh, the applicator gets that map so he gets in the right field. Our truck drivers get that map. And then we actually go out off that map and we flag each field so we don't get in the wrong field. There's nothing worse than dumping a big pile of manure in the wrong field. <laughs> especially if they don't like manure. But then we do this, and this shows our, all of our setbacks. That's We keep that in the farmer's file, too. Then when we go to apply, we have to have a current weather map. By law, it, for manure, it's got to be less than a 50% chance of rain for a half inch of half inch or more rain in a 24-hour period. Now, this is one beef I got with the fertilizer and uh, manure laws. Fertilizer law, you're allowed an inch of rain, 50% chance of an inch of rain in 12 hours. So in a 24-hour period, you can get a forecast of two inches of rain and be legal for, for fertilizer, and you're not legal. you got to only have a half inch for manure. And most of you guys know, fertilizer is more water soluble than manure, so that don't make sense, but that's just a pet peeve of mine. But uh, um, that can be an issue. Um, there's nothing worse than sitting there a day and the sun's actually shining, but you got a forecast within 24 hours, a half inch more rain, and you got to sit. Um, and when you do as much as we do, that sitting just is a killer. You can also, we use basically three different weather channels or weather systems. Um, they always vary a little bit. You just find the one that's most friendly to you. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm being honest, so that gets me in trouble too, so, because there's some state inspectors back there. But uh, they'll straighten me out. We do a little bit of stockpiling. Um, and but most of the time we try to dump and have it spread within 48 hours and if we don't if we don't it's usually because of a rain event and if we see a rain event coming in we try to make sure that we can get as much as we can that we got on the ground spread that day that is down because it's just like when you're working with the public out of sight is as out of mind and if you got a bunch of piles sitting out there for three or four weeks um, you just you get more phone calls because then the neighbors got flies and whatever. But on occasion, we run out of manure every year. So if a guy wants to be guaranteed he's going to get the manure, he can stockpile. And we do have a few guys to do that. But when you stockpile, you got to be so many feet off the road, so many feet from a um, well, so many feet from a house. So we got this form and RSCS does it. And you just draw a map on it. We actually use a Google map. We staple to them. We just put how many tons we stockpile there, when we do it. Once a week, we got to go out and inspect a pile, and we got to log it. Who who does all that? You're, we're responsible for the flies or anything that comes off that pile. So when we do a stockpile, if we're stockpiling, when we get done with that pile, if we don't do it that day, the next day we spray that pile. We come back the next week, we spray it again, and usually by that time, there's enough crust on that manure that. Um, the flies can't, the larvae can't survive, so then it becomes no, a non-fly issue. But, uh, so it usually takes two applications, and then after that, it'll stay there, and the smell really is not too bad once it makes that crust too. Now, if you get a real stiff wind and it blows towards the house, they can smell it. But um, the one thing you don't want to do, and we did this first year on a farm, uh, we didn't get it sprayed quick enough, and when you get flies as a, a problem, it is a son of a gun to get them under control. It, uh, and they do migrate. It's just not 500 feet. They'll, they'll go a half mile and create havoc. 
But then that goes into uh, the farmer's file himself. Just kind of sum things up a little bit. Once you get all this done, now, now, you, now you can go and spread. And uh, the big thing you want to watch when you spread is, is uh, you want to control the odor the best you can. The easiest way to do that is don't spray on a holiday. Don't spray on weekends around a suburb. Um, don't spread when they're having a graduation party. Found that out. Uh, <laughs> don't, don't spread um, a half mile away from the football field on a uh, Thursday night and they got a Friday night football game. Uh, they don't appreciate that either. Uh, same thing, um, control the bugs, make sure you get everything sprayed, control the dust, and uh, pretty much go.